OK, um, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, it would be a joint webinar between DJI and Auburn University today um, under the topic of best practices for corn fungicide application with drones. And, um, my name is Wang. I'm a solutions engineer from DJI Agricultural. Uh, we have the great honor to have Dr. Steve Lee as the guest speaker today. Um, Steve Lee is an extension specialist and associate professor from Auburn University. He has been in research of wheat science, application technology, and crop management science for 15 years and devoted to educate growers with wheat management practices and application technique knowledge and support growers to reduce production costs and increase overall productivity. Um, Steve, could you unmute yourself and introduce you to everyone? Yeah, hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, Steve Lee from Auburn University. Um, you know, I'm working in um, pesticide for the last 15 years, lots of trials in uh, application study, efficacy study. Um, particularly in herbicide and weed science. And then since about three years ago, start to uh, work on uh, all the drone projects and been, have been enjoying it so far. So thanks for the invite. Uh, glad to be here today. Thank you, Steve. And this is the catalog for today's webinar. There will be three sections. In session one, I will share um, my perspectives on why drones could be a good option uh, for corn spraying under several scenarios. And then um, Steve will share his research updates on fungicide tests with Agrax T30 and T40 drones. On top of Steve's results, I will share some fly configuration recommendations, uh, including for both fly parameters and also fly configuration modes. Um, now let's get started. Um, first is why drones on corn. Um, corn spraying are normally handled by tractors and crop testers, which have been around for decades. Um, while most of the time they handle the job very well, um, there are always some pieces of small and irregular shapes in everyone's farm, as shown on the satellite images here, um, of which are normally left untreated or treated by tractor and crop testers with low efficiency and bad quality. Um, for crop testers, the fields with overhead power lines is also a safety threat. Um, in those scenarios, on the other hand, the drone, given its small size and also flexible control performance, it could cover the small and irregular field, uh, shape, shape fields very well mm -hmm. and also approach mm -hmm. um, the obstacles with great precision and accuracy. Oops, one second. Ah, one second. Looks like you're still looking at the old uh, slide. <laughs> Let me share my screen again. Okay, so I guess you are looking at the catalog page at the moment, right? Uh, let me check. Since I can't see the year. Oh, okay, strange. Okay, so. Uh, let me try this. Okay. 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 So there's a little bit te technical problem. <laughs> I guess I will share my screen in this way. It's not the full screen, but hopefully you can still see it well. So I was um, at this page. So the drone is a flexible tool for some special uh, shape and also small uh, plots. 
Um, this is a video showing a T10, the smallest of the drone family, spraying a about 0 0.1 hectare shape, uh, 0 0.1 uh, hectare field in Japan. Another advantage of the drone is that it does not touch the ground. Um, so it could spray right after rain when the tractors cannot move in the field. But meanwhile, the spring window is shut. Um, also, replacing some of the tractor spring uh, with drone could help um, ease the soil compaction. So when soil becomes overly compact, um, its capacity to retain air and water is diminished. And ultimately, um, the productivity of the field is reduced. Um, other than normal spraying, the drone could also be a very versatile tool in the farm. Um, it could handle some special application scenarios. Uh, for example, field terrace spraying. Wheat at the field edge that penetrates into the field is normally handled now by backpack spraying. Um, not only is this waste um, uh, in very low efficiency, it also exposes the human operator to health threats. Um, on the other hand, a drone can fly along the terrace and spray the wheat with precision and also efficiency. Another application is cover crop seeding. Um, Agrarized agricultural drones come with both spring system and also spreading system, uh, spreading cover crop seeds in North America and um, Europe have seen great success at the moment um, because a drone can sit into standing crops, even in the very late season, uh, without damaging the yields. Um, a third example would be strip spraying in both experiment fields and also strip uh, stripping uh, strip cropping system. Um, the drone has a spraying width of about five to ten meter, um, and the spray path could be planned right on top of the crop strips. So it handles this kind of scenario very well. To sum up, agricultural drones can be used at least in the growing corn stages um, before V10, oh, V0, before V0 and between V0 to uh, V5, um, the drone can be used to spray burn down and pre-emergence herbicide and also post-emergence herbicide. Particularly, uh, spot spraying feature of the drone, especially in the burn down process, um, could help save chemicals in great um, in significant amount. Around the T stage, fungicide spraying is a critical application opportunity for the drone, um, given that crop is already tall and aerial spraying is required. Um, during R5 to R6 stage, um, the drone with spreading system could be used for cross uh, seeding. In today's webinar, in the following session, we will focus on fungicide spraying with Juul. So now let's get to session two, T30 and T40 fungicide test results um, by Steve Lee from Auburn University. Um, Steve, please take over and you could share your screen. All right. Okay, how does it look now? Looks good. Looks good. Yep. <clears throat> okay, hear me okay? Audio is yes. fine. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good morning, everyone, or maybe good evening. Um, you know, depends on where you're from. Um, it's a little bit after 10 o'clock uh, Central Time uh, in the US. So first of all, I just want to say um, thank you for <clears throat> your time to participate in the webinar this morning. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, my name is Steve Lee. I'm the extension uh, professor in uh, Auburn University. Uh, also, I work for Alabama Cooperative Extension Service, uh, basically large language university work for the uh, public. Uh, we have been running a bunch of spray drone projects since about two years ago, and um, 
had a fairly good luck with it and was able to generate a bunch of good efficacy results and also um, <clears throat> demonstrate the uh, principle uh, of the uh, spring. So have, you know, I also conducted a bunch of operator trainings so far, which has been fairly popular. Um, I know a lot of the uh, operators in the US have been to my training in, or uh, looked at my educational material online. So I appreciate all of your um, support, supporting me, uh, you know, over the last two years. So uh, just want to get into the presentation from here and also want to appreciate DJI for uh, for the opportunity to present the information to the audience uh, globally. Uh, since this webinar is US focused, uh, we're going to look at a little bit of the uh, background uh, data regarding corn production, a fungus application. So corn is the largest crop in the United States. Probably the US has the largest corn, corn uh, production in the world as well. Uh, I can't guarantee my numbers is up to date, but it should be fairly close. You know, I need to do some data searching at the end of the year from USDA and hopefully can update some of these number. Um, so USDA estimated 15.1 million acre. This is US acre, so 2.47 US acre is one hectare. You know, you can do your own conversion. And I apologize for uh, for using the uh, um, uh, British units here because that's what we use, you know, here in the US. Uh, you can convert a lot of the units back to metric if you want to. Uh, a bunch of the corn gets at least one shot of fungicide. Uh, we are seeing more and more corn actually gets two fungicide application. Those are usually higher yielding field uh, with irrigation. You know, first shot goes out around V8 to V10 stage before the corn gets too tall, too big. And the second application happens um, around or after the uh, tassel stage. In terms of yield loss, it has been well documented over years. Um, the nature of uh, corn uh, or fungus application in general is to prevent uh, disease from uh, showing up and spreading across the field. You know, it's not supposed to cure the, the uh, disease when you have corn rust or tar spot all over the place, you know, and trying to fix the problem when it already show up. So preventative application is very important. And also the disease pressure is highly dependent upon the environmental condition. You know, for example, we've been spraying corn fungicide for two years, two years in a row down here in the southeast um, uh, or southeastern part of the US. This past summer, it has been terribly dry for us. So we were able to see pretty much any disease showing up in our plots, which is a shame. But if you get caught in a wet year, disease pressure is higher. Humidity has been high, you know, constantly um, during the uh, growing season. It's quite likely that you will see fungi, uh, you know, fungus being a problem. So uh, with this new disease called a tar spot to the Midwest, the requirement for area application and also the intensity of the requirement, because those applications all have to go out within about two week window. You know, so loss of airplanes going to the Midwest, loss of needs for area application because the corn gets too tall at that stage, which creates a new market for area application. This is why so many operators, uh, drone operators in the Midwest are quite busy, you know, during um, July and early August, you know, spraying corn fungicide all over the place. Um, and also corn fungicide not only uh, prevent the disease from showing up in the corn foliage. They also prevent the corn from lodging. This is important because if your corn gets too tall, you know, some of the pioneer variety has that problem. Uh, if water is good, fertilizer or nutrient is sufficient, the environmental growing condition is pretty optimum, you can have some pretty big plants. And the issue close to the end of the season is lodging. If you get caught by torrential, or this could be a bad storm, you know, 60 mile per hour wind blow through the field. You could have a, a bunch of corn lying on the ground. Sometimes they can stand back up, sometimes sometime they can't. And also, if fungus damage the pith, you know, inside the stalk, most likely they're not going to be able to go back up. This is why we in the field, we use push test to test the stalk strength 
um, that's usually a good indicator of the uh, fungus infestation and, and your fungicide uh, efficacy. All right, some background information, I'll go into the uh, um, efficacy uh, example. <clears throat> Since it has been so dry for us down here, so I have to rely on the uh, example, successful example from elsewhere. These were cornfields sprayed, or uh, actually this were cornfield uh, located in Pennsylvania. So this uh, picture came from a section where the uh, drone operator didn't spray, and you can see the tar spot ate up the leaves pretty good uh, in this field. Where he sprayed, um, I think he used a Valtima, a BSF fungicide at a seven ounce rate, also with a half ounce of uh, drift reducing agent and deposition aid called Justify. This one came from, uh, this one is made by a Helena a Chemical Company. It was a tank mix sprayed at two gallon per acre with a T40. Uh, at a 13 foot height, fairly flat field, so that's a good height, you know, not too high, not too low. Uh, almost top speed, 32 feet per second, 27 to 28 feet uh, swath width. Uh, uh, the operator observed a pretty good efficacy against tar spot. So I uh, have to appreciate uh, Tyler Flag and the Flag uh, Ag Service for providing the uh, picture. Uh, they operate from Warriors Mark, uh, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and you can see the untreated uh, check strip 60 feet wide in this plot. So he sprayed everywhere in this field and he left a 60 feet wide strip on sprayed. This is his entry check. So close to the end of the season, uh, before corn uh, canopy start to uh, desiccate, you can see this section give up the quickest because of disease pressure, you know, so um, makes a pretty good um, uh, example to show people the efficacy of fungicide spray by the drone. And also, I think Tyler attended my corn fungicide training back in August. So glad the uh, information we created are helpful uh, and supportive for the uh, operator on the ground. So one thing we receive question all about all, all, all the time is about how does spray drone work versus airplane? You know, are these two things equal or one way is better than, than the other? or it kind of depends on the field environment condition and everything, you know. So that has been one of the key questions we try to answer in the last two years of corn application study. You can see after corn flew through, uh, sorry, after the airplane flew across a cornfield and leave a mist of this fluorescent spray dye over the top of the canopy versus when a drone fly over the top of the canopy you can see the drone pushes the canopy open behind it. So I shot this video here uh, with another drone over the top. I mean, you might not be able to see a very uh, smooth video over the uh, over the internet. I apologize for that. It's it's uh, it's just you know uh, frames after frames. But hopefully, you can get to the point that you are able to push the canopy open with the drone. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see, but uh, we're, we're going to discuss a little bit about the propeller downdraft effect. Uh, the more I spray row crop, the less I believe propeller downdraft is a thing or is a, is a main factor that we need to be uh, worried about. Even though it does push the corn canopy open, but I don't know how much good um, it's going to do for us. You know, I'll demonstrate why and I say this later in the talk. We also tried a ground sprayer. Uh, again, it's not a preferred method. As you can tell, the corn gets too tall. Uh, we scraped the top pretty good and caused a bunch of leaf damage. Uh, grower doesn't prefer this way. This, this was on farm trial. He said he, if, if he has to drive his sprayer over one pass of the corn, he's okay with that, but no more than that. So, all right, I said one pass is fine. He sprayed 70 feet, 75, 80 feet wide swath. That's wide enough for us. So in the 2022 study, we evaluate or compare the ground sprayer versus airplane versus a T30. Just want to see if we could tell any difference 
between the application method in terms of deposition and uniformity. And also we want to we want to try drift reducing agent or DRA, you know, and see if those drift reduce agent or DRA makes any difference on the deposition. Due to the time limitation, I'm I'm not gonna go over the 2022 study. Just as a quick result or summary, we saw T30 airplane and the ground sprayer produced a very similar fluorescent dye concentration and a, and a spray uniformity at the Blakely Georgia site. Ground sprayer had the best uniformity and lowest coefficient variation or CV across the swath, which is expected because it sprayed a 15 gallon per acre. Uh, T30 and airplane only spray two. All right, so that's totally makes sense. But if I really fly T30 using a little higher height, 15 feet high in terms of 10, and also really narrow swaths, you know, a 15 feet swath and 12 feet high versus eight feet high, you know, 12 feet wide, 12 feet tall, we produced a pretty low CV, almost comparable to the ground sprayer. So you can get it even, you can get a dye or the chemical spray very evenly, but it's going to take a toll on your efficiency because using 12, using a 15 feet swath is a pretty narrow um, swath width, you know, versus 25 feet, 22 feet, or, or I heard some people push 27 feet for T30, you know, you're losing a lot of efficiency to trade for the uniformity. Uniformity looks really good, but your efficiency will take a big toll. Um, that's the trade-off. Uh, we saw, um, we saw higher dye concentration on the corn year leaf um, and, and, you know, upper leaf at, as well at the uh, uh, Talladega side. This is in Alabama compared to the ground sprayer, uh, which is great. I misspelled sprayer there. I apologize for that typo. Um, it seems that dye concentration on the upper leaf, you know, the second leaf above the year leaf has a tendency to be higher than the year leaf, but not always. Uh, this also agreed, this conclusion also also agreed with our uh, 2023 uh, data. Sometimes you see the highest concentration on the leaf being the top leaf, close to the top of the canopy. Sometimes the year leaf has higher um, dye concentration, so it's not real uniform, you know. Lots of variation um, that you have to deal with when you work with uh, a reapplication, you know. We test airplanes several times just the same way. Now, DRA showed a trend to increase year uh, leaf dye concentration and seemed to reduce dye variation by a little bit, but those were not statistically significant, which was a shame. So after last year's study, one of my goal was to hopefully using better DRA or different drone or whatever method so I can put more fluorescent dye, which is my tracer, onto the corn year leaf and this will be significantly more or higher dye concentration on the year leaf versus without the DRA. So that was my goal at the end of 2022 and I was able to achieve that uh, this year which is good but still not picture perfect you know I'll, I'll show what I mean in a minute. So in 2023, we got a little fancy because we got T30 and T20, uh, so sorry, not only T30, but also T40 and T20P. Uh, road tray atomizer has been a big improvement, particularly when we spray um, fairly thick tank mix, you know. Uh, T30, the fly fat nozzle just can't do it uh, because of pressure, you know, and the viscosity of the tank mix. T40 and T20P road tray atomizer can spread those really thick juice uh, fairly well over top of the crop, you know, because uh, a lot of time we mix pinot fungicide with boron foliar uh, feed, you know, and some insecticide with it. That three-way mix is pretty pretty darn thick. Let's put it this way, almost like spraying us paint, you know, so the rotor atomizer handled it fairly well. So the objective of the study for this year was to compare spray drone uh, model between the spray drone models and also to the airplane, which is the same objective as 2022. And also keep evaluating DRA on deposition and uniformity. We also added two objectives, which is um, evaluate two versus three GPA and also evaluate fly direction. You know, you fly along the rows and also fly across the rows, you know, perpendicular to the rows and see if that plays a factor on, on deposition, you know. 
So that was a two new tweaks uh, tweak uh, we added to the study this year. Um, a bunch of parameters here. I'm not going to go into everything. You know, I'm sure the uh, uh, presentation is recorded. You can go back to the uh, recording and dig into the uh, specific uh, details if you want to. So uh, we flew mostly with two GPA. Now we do have one treatment. We call it high quality treatment with T40. That's we use a three GPA. When we use three GPA, we have to use narrower swath and also a little slower speed because the flow rate limitation. I'm going to mention this at the end of the talk, you know, why we need a higher flow rate combined with higher speed. All right, uh, use the original dual disk, not a single disk. For T30, we stretch the swath wider, 25 feet swath, top speed 10 feet high because it's very flat ground. So we just fly, uh, we just flew 10 feet using the XR 110 fire nozzle. Uh, we also flew across the rows, you know, using the same high efficiency uh, setting. This this setting literally just stretched the T40 to the limit. You know, I don't recommend it all the time, but uh, for research, I think it's fine because it's about as as fast as you can go with T40. All right, and the airplane also uses a two GPA. I'll provide the uh, uh, airplane info in the next page. So that's was the uh, setup, the treatment. For all the DRA treatment, we tested four. You know, for folks who live outside the U.S., this these names may not mean too much to you. I'm just gonna explain DRA as a group as a whole. You know, and also with one experimental DRA. All of the DRA treatment was mixed with uh, water and spray dye, which is put DRA at, at the end and the fluid with the highest efficiency setting. All right. Uh, the other difference between 2022 and this year's uh, study was the wind. You know, in 2022, we had a lot of uh, windless day, which is a typical southeast or deep south weather. Now, this past summer, it was very weird. You know, climate change has become a real uh, thing for us now. It was really hot for so long, very, very dry. Uh, we may only got two weeks of rain since July, you know, and it didn't rain at all since first week of September, yes, yesterday was the first day we got rain, so we were happy, you know, cover crop can finally start to grow because we do have cover crop sp uh, spreading trials goes, you know, goes into the field now. So the big difference between last year and this year's trial was the wind. We do have way more wind compared to last year. Last year was generally below three to four, maybe five mile per hour tops. This year we recorded a gust over 20, an average wind of about 14, you know, just can't beat to the wind. So you have to live with the wind, just see what's going to do, you know, to your uh, uniformity um, testing. All right. So uh, weather uh, data has been shown here. Um, we also did a second application. The first application, this one was done in June the 17th. Um, we know right after the tassel stage. The second application was done a month later, uh, just because we want to play a little bit with T20P and also called another two uh, planes to see what we can do. At that point, corn is a pretty old, you know, canopy just start to dry up a little bit. So I have to see that I have to say the uh, canopy is not as a thick, uh, was not as thick as compared to back in June, you know, so it opened up a little bit gap. Uh, for the droplets to go down. So that's that's the difference between the first and second application. Still uh, got anywhere between 8 to 10 mile per hour wind when we spray. Uh, this is true for both drone and airplane. Uh, so the wind speed was fairly consistent between the treatments. You know, none of the treatment was sprayed in uh, wind free or, or calm wind condition. Tested different planes. Um, I'm not pretending I know a lot about the uh, spray planes uh, and they're, they come with all different makeup models, uh, designs, nozzle types. Um, you know, they can fly at a different speed, they use different swath. Um, you know, you can spray at a different pressure and you can spray close to the crop or sometimes if they spray way above the crop because of obstacles. So there's a lot of variation too, you know, with, with the uh, airplanes. You know, can't make too much of general conclusion, but just list whatever information I got from the crop duster, you know, without telling um, or without being able to tell uh, much of a difference here. But those are all those all those three planes are commercial spray planes, you know. 
Uh, two locations, half application was made on tassel stage corn after pollination. Second application was a month later. We used both fluorescent dye, water sensor paper, uh, you know, for the study. Most data was collected on year leaf because corn fungicide has to protect the year leaf. Year leaf contributes to 20 to 30 percent of your overall yield because it's right next to the year, you know. Uh, it's the most important uh, one in terms of the uh, yield component. Also, we did a few vertical sampling using the second leaf above the year leaf and the second leaf be below the year leaf. We call it we call those high leaf, year leaf, and low leaves. You know. So this is how the uh, Columbia side look like back in June. Really, really thick corn. Even though we don't produce a lot of corn down here, uh, we do have some. This is a high yielding field, about 258 uh, bushel per acre yield. Uh, irrigation, really good grower, top notch grower. You know, he he averaged a three and a half bale of cotton. You know, 250 bushels of corn. Um, you know, 6,000 pounds of peanut. Just whatever they do, they they're top notch. <clears throat> Again, that's the video I took when I walk into the corn. Uh, it's a pretty tough job. Uh, hot, humid, and you get you get scratches from the corn. Uh, and the pollens and the dust that get you all the time, you know, your cough, allergies become a problem, you know, I have to give my uh, student crew and grad student a lot of credit to get a project done for two, year, two years in a row. It's a, it's a pretty difficult one. Um, so a uh, quick uh, picture to show water sensor paper, which is nothing fancy. All of y'all have seen it before. This plastic card is called Malacars. Malacars, that's what we use to capture the uh, fluorescent dye because we can wash the dye off the card and be able to analyze it uh, quantitatively down to one parts per billion. So, right, my PhD student Livia, she was putting out the uh, water sensor paper and the Milo cards, you know, uh, using the clips. She got clips all over her, you know, that's the best way to uh, carry the clips that she figured out. Uh, so lots of creativity and hard work, uh, you know, goes into these trials all the time. All right, so we sprayed uh, 250 by 150 block last year, and this year this block is even bigger. It's about four acres, three to four acres. We laid out three transects. Transects means 25 plants at a three feet apart. Those are all the plants we sampled in this fashion to collect data. So we do have three transects where we collect the data, and also, um, you know, that allow us to run the uh, statistics because we have replications. Um, and then we got uh, the uh, samples back, either the corn leaf or the metal cars. We washed the dye off, analyzing the lab using the uh, fluorometer, meter. And you can see um, the color from the uh, samples. The, each of this little vial, two mil vial, holds a sample from one corn leaf. Um, now, first, you can see the variation. This is a very visual picture to tell you it's not going to be as, as uh, uniform as you think. Some of the leaf got more hits, some of the leaf got not many hits, you know. So it's a very visual way to tell you what uniformity or inconsistent means in every application. But with DRA, we have seen color become stronger. So that means more dye gets sprayed on the leaves, which is a good thing. But variation is still there. Variation is still there, all right? All right, looking at the data, um, I hope I can get this part through fairly quickly. Um, don't want to stretch too long. T30, T40 airplane uh, comparison. Uh, this number means nanogram of the dye, act, uh, active ingredient of the spray dye on uh, the card in terms of in terms of square uh, centimeter. Uh, all these data were collected from corn year leaf, which is the most important part that we need to protect. Um, differences? Not really. Uh, statistically, they're pretty much all the same, you know. Uh, airplane did a fairly good job uh, this time. This plane is fairly accurate. We used it in 2022, so we were impressed by his accuracy. So we called him back and sprayed again. So statistically, it was all the same at both locations. All right, what about 2 GPA, T42 GPA versus T43 GPA? versus T42 GPA, but fly across the crop rows. All right, 
three GPA is better than two. You know, we confirm that in Blakely side. In Columbia side, it showed a trend of increased die for the three GPA versus the two. Although this increase was not a big enough to be statistically different, but I believe after keep trying this over more location next year and in the future, we will be able to record more statistical increase with three GPA versus two. We just have to repeat the treatment and study uh, more often in the future. And also spray from east to west. It didn't bring anything to the table, but statistically it's the same as flying across the row as well. It's not statistically different between these two. So that provide a flexibility for the operator. You know, if for some field spray across the row makes most of sense, then just do it. You know, um, we haven't seen much difference between the flying along the row and across row on quantum function side. All right, looking at the vertical sampling data. Remember I mentioned high leaf is the second leaf about a year leaf. Low leaf is the second leaf before the year leaf, below the year leaf. So you get a perspective of how the spray die get into the canopy and go across the canopy, all right? So three different color uh, indicates the dye concentration on three different leaf across the canopy, all right? The statistics is a little bit confusing. If you understand, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. You know, you cannot compare the letters uh, across different leaves, which means if the color st stay the same, you can compare the letters, which means this orange A, orange A, orange A, orange A, that means no statistical difference. But you cannot compare orange A to this gray color B. You know, you can't do that. Uh, so that's why I say it's a little bit confusing. It's made, made, we made a graph to, uh, to show in the research conference. But overall speaking, Airplane versus drone, we saw a trend that drone blew more dye into the canopy, you know, in terms of the, uh, the number, all right? And also with the distribution between a high year leaf and low leaf, sometimes the high leaf had highest dye concentration, sometimes year leaf had, had the highest concentration. And also if you look at the Blakely Georgia side, year leaf had highest concentration over here, but with airplane, you know, the top leaf or the high leaf had higher concentration. So it's really not consistent. But what we care the most is still the year leaf. It's still the year leaf. All right. Um, we saw a significant difference between the concentration of airplane and a drone uh, at Blakely, Georgia side. If you look at the year leaf concentration with DRA, without DRA, and also with airplane one and airplane two, we saw significant increase between these two bars versus this one. All right, so that's significantly better than the airplane over there. But at the other side, you know, you look at this blue, uh, weird blue color bars, you know, they all got A, 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 A on them. That means they're not statistically different. So again, it's hard to say which one is better, you know. So right as of right now, we still say when you operate your drone as the highest efficiency, you're probably gonna re reach the similar results as a airplane. You know, I don't see the evidence or strong evidence to say one way or it's definitely better than the other way. You know, we don't have enough replication and a study over a different location to uh, to make that case. But we also saw the tendency that. If you look at a low leaf concentration, drone was significantly higher than the low leaf in this case. And also with the DRA, you see the penetration was better than the lower leaf. So DRA still help the fluorescence dye get deeper, deeper into the canopy versus airplane just spray water and fluorescence dye or without fluorescence dye. You know, it seemed that we saw a little bit of effect from the DRA, but not a whole lot. Just that because this, all these data come from the second application. Corn canopy already start to dry up a little bit. So DRA effects start to diminish at that point. And also second application was sprayed by T20P. You know, you can see the highest dye concentration we recorded was over 100, 100 nanogram per square centimeter. All right. And then with T40 on thicker leaves, we got about 50 to 60, somewhere around the range. Highest was 90, you know. so. 
Um, I know that's not an apple to apple comparison because that was not spread at the same timing, but Little Drone can still do a decent job uh, because the propeller downdraft effect is a fairly minimal when you operate at the top speed. I'll, I'll demonstrate that point at the end of the talk. All right, in terms of uniformity, um, not a whole lot of difference with or without the RA. And also airplanes uniformity versus drone was similar. Over here, we saw airplane had a higher uniform, a higher uh, variation and the lower uniformity than the spray drones, but that's only one location. In our 2022 study, uniformity was a fairly similar between a drone and airplane. So I'm not going to say one is better than the other. It kind of depends on the pilot, the airplane setup, the nozzle, you know, environmental condition, all of those. It's just a lot of variation in general. Let's put it this way. All right, what about a drift reducing agent or the DRAs? All right, let's look at the percentage of coverage from the water sensor paper placed on the uh, year leaves. Now, in general, you know, if you look at the Intech Experimental DRA Ultralock AccuDrop, in general, these four bars and also these uh, these four bars at the both location at the both location increased the the, the uh, uh, percentage percentage of coverage versus T40 by itself. Remember, all these DRAs were sprayed using the similar setting compared to T40 uh, spraying just water and fluorescent dye, you know. Uh, so setting here and the setting here are the same. They are the same. So it's hard to tell which DRA works consistently better, you know, just because there are so many DRAs out there. You don't test the one thing enough, you can't make a uh, final conclusion. You don't have enough degree of confidence to say so. But the problem is there's no way we can test them all. And this type of trial are pretty horrible enough, you know, to tackle. So we really have to control the treatment size and the overall amount of work. So at this point, I can only say DRA as a group in general can increase the dye or the uh, fungicide deposition on the year leaf it's a good thing to do but again it's not gonna be super consistent it's not like you add a dra and it works across all sides you can document significant increase of deposition on all, at all locations sometimes still hit and miss but it's a generally it's a good practice to do why do i say that because you're not only dealing with one problem which is increasing the deposition on the corn you're also fighting against drift you know, this is not 12 mile per hour wind. This is anywhere between 15 to 20 mile per hour wind on average. Some of the gusts might be over 30, you know. As you can see, nothing stays on target. It all blown away. It all got blown away downwind. How far these spray dye can travel, I don't know. I mean, some of my students never got it close to the drone uh, when they were spraying. They were standing, you know, four or 500 feet downwind. Everybody at the end of the day got sprayed off because this guy got on your clothes. It's very obvious. You can tell them. we all got sprayed off. You know, those aerial drift can travel pretty far uh, when the drone produce small droplets and you got enough wind to blow them away. Why I'm showing that, all right? We want to increase deposition, particularly under windy condition because drone has to use smaller droplets to achieve coverage when you spray with a low GPA, you know, two, three GPA, all right? Uh, that's just the life we got to deal with in row crop. Either you get your coverage or, you know, you prevent the drift, but when you prevent the drift, you lose your coverage. It's very difficult to get both. All right, looking at this data we collected that day when I shot that video, we flew the drone on top of this zero feet position. The drone was flying on top of this line, all right? Minus number above zero. Minus number means upwind. Wind was blowing from, um, you know, from left to right, you know, from this way to that way. And then the uh, positive number means downwind deposition. All right. So these are deposition data. If you look at water with with fluorescence dye, you know, of, of course we only measure the coverage, so it's only water basically. Water showed a deposition curve like this and then start to drift downwind, particularly, you know, beyond 30 feet. All right, at a 75 feet, they don't make a lot of difference beyond that point, between 75 to 150. With the DRA, you know, 
Yeah, but the DRA, I would say we, we, we tested four different DRAs. I'm not going to tell you which one is which. Uh, it didn't make a whole lot of difference um, from 75 feet down to 150 feet. Particularly at 150 feet, we still saw a few hits on the ground, but there's not a lot, not a lot. It doesn't mean that all the droplets you know, uh, landed on the ground within a 150 feet because over in the air, you still got uh, some stuff keep flying in the air that haven't, you know, haven't hit anything. So those field may just completely move off the field, become your drift problem. Hopefully that's not some oxygen herbicide or something nasty, you know, that can piss off your neighbor. All right, so downwind deposition side, we don't see a whole lot after 75 feet, but what you might have to consider here, uh, you know, this might be a setting point for the DRA, you know, for you to believe is if you look at the deposition curve around zero position, remember this is where a drone was flying, the belly, the drone's belly was facing the, uh, uh, the zero uh, position mark. You see all these curves where I added a DRA with water, we document a significant increase of percentage coverage. So that position was significantly increased on water sensor paper. This much, this much of water was able to go back to the ground. Otherwise, they would just have been aerial or airborne drift and move off your field and piss off your neighbor. So your DRA was able to recapture this portion of the water and put them back on the ground. Again, prevent your money from fly off the field because all your chemicals are your money, you know. Drift, it piss off your neighbor, you know, it piss off regulatory agencies, uh, chemical manufacturers, registrants, no, nobody likes it, we don't like it either. Uh, and also for your perspective, it's your money flying off the field because nobody will give you a chemical for free, you know. So the more chemical you can recover from the drift, the more efficacy you will observe after your job, which also a good selling point in front of your um, grower or customers. All right, I like visual stuff, you know, I have a ton of data, but I don't typically show those data in extension uh, meeting or events. If you look at the water sense paper image, <coughs> we flew T40 using a uh, medium setting. Medium setting, that was the old setting, um, you know, uh, that we used last year. That's about 200 micron fine droplets. If you look at uh, T40 200 micron at 150 feet downwind, we got a bunch of hits, all right? But with a DRA at 1% uh, of volume, that's one gallon to 100 gallon tank mix, we significantly reduce the hits at 150 feet. So it still helps, you know, helps you with downwind deposition. So quick summary, probably talk long enough, you know, 2023 study, uh, T30, T40 were pretty similar in terms of deposition <coughs> and the coverage, uh, same, same as airplane. Uh, we, we're not going to be able to make a conclusion that we observe um, some noticeable difference. Uh, and again, T20P did a pretty good too. Actually, high skeptic concentration was documented with T20P. 3GPA generally increased the cover coverage and diet concentration compared to two. Um, flying across road didn't matter versus flying along the roads. So you can do either way in your uh, uh, route planning. Drift reducing agent generally increased diet concentration, but I'm not able to tell you which one works the best because it's not that consistent. You know, that whole group works, but it's kind of hit and miss which one you choose. You know, uh, generally speaking, that they're, they're a good practice to use. Um, year leaf coverage and deposition uh, vary a little bit. Sometimes we see higher uh, deposition on the top leaf. Sometimes year leaf got more um, uh, deposition or diet concentration. Uh, DRA effects start to diminish in the second application when corn canopy start to dry up. And also in this year's data, I didn't show the, uh, show the uh, bar graph here because time limitation, but DRA had a little effect on spray uniformity. So the CV was about a similar, but it, it did increase the uh, deposition. All right, last portion of the talk. Some ideas and, and the discussion points. <clears throat> you know, at this, at this stage, we believe drones can deliver corn fungicides similarly to airplane and ground sprayers. But that's based on the premises of you know how to run it, you know the basics, how to select droplets, how to how to prevent the wind, you know how to uh, do quality jobs. If you are a good operator, your efficacy should be pretty similar to drone and ground sprayer. 
And again, it's too early to make a final conclusion about drone versus airplane. You know, there may not be a conclusion at the end, or the conclusion might be they're about the same. You know, particularly when you operate your drone as at the maximum efficiency. I don't believe you have much of a propeller downdraft at that point when you fly your drone at 20, 30 mile per hour. Uh, addition of drift reducing agent is generally a good practice, although identify the best candidate can take a very long time, if that's possible. Uh, tank incompatibility is a common problem, particularly when you want to put everything in one tank and still spray at a two GPA because half of your tank is a pure chemical. You know, it's very little water in it. We have seen a bunch of incompatibility problem this past summer, particularly when you put fungicide, insecticide, foliar feed, DRA all together in the same tank. All right. This is a, a, a um, demonstration we did with tank mixing. Uh, when you mix Provosor fungicide with Mostem, uh, Mostem uh, Max uh, insecticide together, they mix just fine. They spray just fine. No problem. Provosor spray really well. That's a BSF fungicide, you know, with a drone. Uh, but the uh, the jar or the, the bottle on the left was without ENC flax, uh, uh, which is a foliar fertilizer, foliar feed. The bottle on the right got an ENC flax as a foliar feed. Ten minutes later, you can observe a really nice separation of the layer. All right, that doesn't do you much good in the field. So um, testing for uh, compatibility with the jar is very important, especially if this is a new tank mix you never sprayed before. Don't just don't just assume it's going to work because if you messed up 100 acre worth of product, you know they all separated layer, you know, or be, uh, forming cheese uh, or uh, cake icing in the tank. Uh, if you're a commercial operator, guess what? You're just gonna have to pay for the chemical yourself because grower gave you a chemical and you messed up, you know, you know, and you're 100 acre short of product. You know, probably you call the farmer, he's not gonna pay for the chemical, so you'll have to eat up the loss at the end, which is not good. And also, I mentioned the point of drone versus airplane. You know, what about this uh, propeller downdraft thing with a uh, spray drone? Because we don't observe a lot when airplane fly across top of the corn. You know, corn canopy remain fairly calm, and we can blow wind through through the corn canopy. Does that propeller downdraft <coughs> or downwash play a factor? <coughs> <coughs> Not a lot, um, because when you fly your drone really fast, and I believe most of the operators have seen this in the field, your tail, or I should say the tail of the droplets or droplet droplet tail, always trail behind the drone for pretty far. All right, this is uh, see when the drone turns, yeah, that's where you blew everything straight down, right there. You know, so when the drone turns. Everything goes straight down, and this is where you can create some streaking issue because your band, your spray band or spray swath, go really, really narrow. So it's always a good practice to raise your drone for a couple of feet at the end, so you don't have a uh, clear turn mark at the edge of the field. I document those when I spray burn down or contact herbicide. Uh, you know, if anyone interested, I can show you those turn marks around the uh, field edges. Pretty significant. Oh, my bad. But after the drone turns, it starts to build up the speed. You know, you can see propeller downdraft on wheat leaves. But as the drone starts to build up speed, that propeller downdraft starts to diminish and the, the tail starts to form. All right. You can see a lot of droplets got left behind, left behind, left behind. And there's no downdraft, you know, no downdraft sign anymore on the wheat. All right, it's going to take a while for this tail to fall on the ground because if you spray two to three GPA, this is this is a really nice example when we spray the uh, corn uh, morning glory before harvest. You can see the T30 break up the, the uh, tank mix in a really good way. The atomization is, is pretty impressive and it start to blow this mist into the canopy of morning glory is all weeds and I'm getting good spread on both and a little bit wind not too much not too much but as you can imagine it's gonna take all these small droplets a while to get into the canopy and by that time your drone is long gone you know the propeller downdraft is long gone propeller downdraft won't last for longer than two seconds 
but the free fall of your droplets take a while. It could be, you know, 30 seconds or even longer. Depends on how small the droplets are and how strong is the wind is, you know. So what do you mean? What I mean is we did a lot of depth deposition testing and demonstration for the public because we work for the public, you know, operations pay for the public and as supposed to benefit everyone, particularly benefit the farmers. We put a lot of small plastic tissue dishes on the ground when we run row crop depositions. See, in this case, is a petri dish with a filter paper placed on top of peanut canopy. Peanut canopy is not very straight. It's a little, little difficult to put the water, to put this uh, petri dishes on without tilting or falling, you know. So it's literally a petri dish on the peanut foliage. And then we flew T30 and T40 at the top speed and do our spray demo. And guess what? At the end of spray demo, all the petri dishes remain on top of the canopy and didn't even get blown off. All right. That just demonstrate the propeller downdraft pretty much just don't really exist in this case because I can blow off this petri dishes. If I put my mouth next to it, just blow wind, you know, blow some air through my mouth, I can blow it off the uh, canopy. It doesn't really take much wind to get it off, right? And after the demo, most of them still remain in place. And that's true when I place petri dishes on the flat ground, whether, whether this is dirt or on top of the mold grass. If you fly drone at top speed, they will be right there just fine. If you don't believe it, go run your test yourself at home. But when you slow down your drone, let's just say we're talking about six, seven, eight feet, it's going to blow these petri dishes all over the place. We learned that lesson when we run specialty crop through trade mission. Because when you fly slow, your propeller downdraft and your can and your um, um, uh, droplets, you know, the clone, two clones of droplets created by created by two rotary uh, uh, atomizer, those two things overlap, you know. So the strong propeller downdraft will push the two cones directly into the canopy, and there's not a separation between the two. Normally, the droplet tail trails behind, and then the uh, pushing force um, uh, is closer to the drone, you know. <clears throat> but this is what I mean by blowing the droplets directly into the canopy. That was just spraying water, right? So when you spray thicker canopy, particularly fruit trees, heavier drone, full load, more propeller pushing force, more, or more propeller downdraft is always a good thing. We can usually tell a difference between a lighter drone, lighter drone and a heavier drone. For example, in this case, we tested both the T20P and T40. And you know T40 is two times heavier than T20P at least. Water sensor paper placed on top of the blueberry, in the middle of the blueberry, at the bottom blueberry canopy. Just by looking at the deposition on the water sensor paper, you can figure out the conclusion I want to say, you know, yourself. Um, so this is why for horticulture application, particularly thicker canopy, we need a bigger drone, we need a bigger tank, we need a higher flow rate, and we need more propeller downdraft. All right. <clears throat> Again, propeller downdraft, I don't expect will be a main factor when you spray at a very high speed, 20 to 30 mile per hour, uh, using, you know, two, three GPA. It don't even blow the pitcher dishes off the peanut canopy. So not going to do you much um, uh, good, you know, uh, if you're hoping to using the wind to blow uh, droplets into the canopy. Flying direction had a minimum uh, effect. Consistent high to manage is challenging on rolling hills. Uh, that's that's a uh, uh, drawback um, with the current drone. So hopefully the ter terrain sensor gets better in the future. And also avoid wind as much as possible. Although we sprayed around 10 mile per hour average wind, do I, you know, if you ask me, do I like it? No, I still wish I have less than five mile per hour wind, you know, to do it. But uniformity was still around that 50 to 80 percent range in terms of CV. So it wasn't very, very different compared to last year, although last year's CV was a little bit lower because less wind. And again, <clears throat> I, I mentioned this number, uh, 3 2.34 GPA before on T40. You know, I mentioned this first time in my corn fungicide training back in August. I said, if you fly 30 feet swath at top speed, 
using 2.34 GPA doesn't necessarily cost you more time to spray out the uh, tank load. Although you're spraying 17% more volume across the field, you know. So spraying out those volume doesn't cost you any more time to do it, but it does cost you more time to fly the drone back, refill the tank and fly out. So it may still slow you down a little bit. This is why I said you can consider to max out your flow rate and do 2.34 GPA uh, versus 2 GPA, you know, using this setting because it doesn't really <coughs> slow you down when it gets to spray out the amount of liquid. You just have to refill maybe three more times, you know, if it is a hundred acre field. Um, you know, it does it does slow you down a little bit because of refill, but in terms of job quality, you put out 17% more volume, which can increase the job quality. And this bring out the last point. Hopefully with future drone with bigger flow rate and also bigger flow rate has to go with um, faster speed or potentially even wider swath at the same time. Hopefully with all three things or at least with higher flow rate and higher speed, we can make a three gallon per acre to be more common in future application because three GPA increased deposition and also three GPA or more GPA is a good way to fight against wind drift. Uh, we already seen data coming from Canada to demonstrate that point. You know, um, the overall percentage lost through drift is significantly less when you spray five GPA versus two. You know, we're, we're going to do that type of trial next year, hopefully to demonstrate you can maintain most of your product into this field when you spray higher GPA versus two. But we need the help from the equipment uh, manufacturers to give us higher flow rate, higher speed, and hopefully wider swath at the same time. Um, we'll keep working on this type of stuff next year. Hopefully, we can create a collaboration between multiple land-grant institutions in the U.S. At this point, I know uh, UGA and Purdue University got the interest, and they can grab uh, NC State on board as well. So maybe next year um, or the year after next, when we present the data, it could be a multi-state collaboration project, which is you know provides more uh, confidence in the results. Um, probably talk too much again, uh, which is always a problem when I run training. You know, I told people I, I, the training will end an hour, usually goes for about two, you know. Uh, any question, welcome to send me an email, uh, um, you know, to follow up. Um, also want to appreciate all my hardworking grad students, student workers, student interns. You know, without them, we couldn't get anything done. At least I couldn't get anything done. I'll be, I'll be just a useless old man, you know, uh, telling jokes at the field edge. So that's basically what my role is when we run field projects. Uh, also want to do some shameless uh, self-promotion. Uh, the second spray drone end user conference is going to happen February 26th to 29th, uh, then Monday to uh, Thursday of the last week of February. Uh, we've, we have a hotel, uh, um, you know, hosting the event this time. It'd be mostly in person with uh, some remote option, you know, for folks who cannot be here uh, in person. But there will be several panel discussion, group discussion, plenty networking opportunities, and uh, field demo as well. So hope to see everyone there uh, if you're interested in uh, the event. Uh, registration information should be coming out in the next three to four weeks. Just stay tuned. All right, Win, uh, that's it. Back to you. Thank you, Steve. Um, those are very, very helpful information. And I myself will try my best to be in the event next year. <laughs> yeah, it's a 2024 <laughs> event, not 2023. Um, and um, next, I will on top of Steve's information and uh, insights regarding um, the deposition and uniformity uh, comparison between two aircraft and tractor and also the spring effects and the different flight parameter configurations. Um, combining our experience from uh, the field, mainly from our users in North America, I would like to share some recommendations uh, for both flight parameters and also drone mode configuration. So I'm going to share my screen again. <clears throat> Uh, 
OK, so first part is the fly parameter recommendation. Um, before we get into the uh, actual recommendation itself, we need to first understand how different parameters respectively and also in combined affects the spring result. Um, the parameters we've discussed includes the swap width, speed, height, droplet size, and also GPA, or the application rate, uh, which we are all uh, very curious about. And the effect on the position, penetration, um, uniformity, efficiency, and also shift, uh, all the things that Steve have talked about. Um, for deposition, application rate is the major factor, obviously. Um, larger application rate generates higher deposition, as Steve mentioned. Um, and, but at the same time, um, the higher the application rate, um, the lower the efficiency it will be. So there's always trade-off. For penetration, uh, it is a very important thing to consider, especially if you are spraying thick canopy. Um, lowering the speed, flying slower and also lower, would generate stronger downwash onto the canopy to push the droplets uh, through the canopy and gets to the bottom. Um, at the same time, finer droplet size would help as well. Um, the finer the droplets are, the less likely it will be captured by the upper canopy and then penetrates and gets to the bottom. Um, uniformity, first of all, we need to understand that uh, different chemicals are uh, have different sensitivity to uniformity. Um, herbicide is a typical chemical that's highly sensitive to uniformity. Uh, setting a swath width too narrow would generate um, kills. Um, I want to show you a picture here that might make it clear. A second, since I have a little bit screen sharing problem here, I need to do it this way. So as I mentioned, herbicide is very sensitive to uniformity. If we set the spring width to be too narrow, uh, we would have an overspring issue. And we would see um, some crops being harmed um, in the overlapping area. On the other side, if we set the swath width too wide, we we'll have spring gaps between the fry paths. Um, the result of that would be the weeds in between are not killed after the spraying. So a proper swap width is very important to ensure uniformity. And that's very important for chemicals like herbicide. Um, fungicide, I would say, is a little bit less sensitive to uniformity. Um, and on the other end, uh, swap width, speed, and height, they should be set in combined to be in a reasonable range to achieve high uniformity. Um, efficiency, if your speed and um, Swath are um, so basically have a wider swath width would increase efficiency, but on the other hand, uh, exceeding the reasonable range would also sacrifice your um, swath, your uniformity as well. And flying um, in higher speed would help to increase efficiency if the environment is allowed. But on the other side, uh, flying in a higher speed would also increase your potential of Drift. Um, to decrease your drift, in addition to use um, DRA as Steve recommended, um, some other methods would be to fly lower and also to set a higher job size. Um, overall, these are some recommended parameters that we summarize from um, the common practices of our North American users uh, for corn spring for fungicide. Um, for T40 and for T30. For T40, um, the common swap width um, that you could set is around 28 feet, which is about 8.5 meter. And for speed, uh, we recommend using around 32.8 feet per second, which is about 10 meter per second. And for height, you could set it to be 12 to 15 feet, which is around uh, 3.7 to 4.6 meter. Droplet size, um, it is recommended to set to the medium class, which is 320 um, micrometer. Um, for T30, um, the height is the same that we recommend. And for swap width, we recommend reducing it to 20 to 25 feet, which is about 6 to 7.6 meter. And for speed, 
we recommend set, setting to the range of 20 to 23 feet per second, which is six to seven meter per second. Um, and for DIA drift uh, reduction agent, as Steve mentioned, it is always recommend to use to increase your deposition and also decrease the drift. Sorry, typo here is decrease the drift. Sorry about that. Okay, so that was about the fly parameter recommendation. Um, how about the mode recommendation? In addition to the fly parameter, in order to ensure our spring quality and also safety, setting the drone to be a correct mode is also very important. And according to some common scenarios that North America users would face in corn spring, uh, we have the following recommendations. Um, the first one is how to maintain terrain following in rolling landscape. Using the corn belt region in North America as an example, rolling landscape is very common. And in order to maintain a good spring quality, we need to maintain a constant spring height above the terrain. Um, and how do we do that? If you are spring in a rolling landscape, we always recommend select the mountain land mode on the task terrain and turn on the obstacle by passing. Um, in this case, the radar and also vision sensing system would be leveraged to maintain the terrain follow. So this, this configuration would give you the best performance in rolling landscape. And the second one is about how to spray precisely in the field. Um, not outside of the field and also on spot, especially if you are doing spot spraying. So we always recommend using RTK in field mapping and also in field spraying. Um, RTK is the technology that would increase your position and accuracy to uh, centimeter level accuracy. Um, for RTK, the drone system supports two source. One is network RTK, another, another one is RTK station. So for network RTK, uh, as long as your network RTK services is in entry format and RTCM 3.2 protocol version, um, it is supported by the drone. What that means is you could use some government service and also commercial ser service. Uh, for example, in North America, Department of Transportation provides the network RTK service in this format to the public. So you could leverage the resources or if you have subsequent of some commercial RTK services, you could use those as well. Um, another option, if you don't have good network in the field, which is quite common, you could also use the DRTK2 station um, to achieve RTK level accuracy. And if you really don't have access to any of those, another option that you could use is the rectify offset function. Um, in that case, what it means is if you map the field under GNSS accuracy, not connecting to any network RTK or RTK station source, um, your map with either your drone or your remote controller, uh, just based on the satellite imagery um, on the base map. Then when you do the spraying, you could use the rectify offset feature. The way to do that is you could hover your drone over a feature port, such as the field corner of your field, and see whether the position of your drone matches your actual field, uh, match, matches the field corner of what you map. If not, then you click on rectify offset and then move your field manually to match the drone's real time location. So this is a good way to increase the uh, spring accuracy if you uh, really don't have any access to RTK resources. Okay, and the next one is how to maintain connection, especially in large fields and rolling landscape. Um, in addition to those two factors, we know that corns are tall crops and standing on the ground uh, and doing operation would give you quite a lot of connection issue between your remote controller and the drone. Um, a good way to resolve the problem is the DJI relay, uh, which I show here. Um, setting the DJI relay above the canopy, normally we recommend five meters above the canopy, 
would help you to maintain the connection between your remote controller and your drone. Um, this is a good way to resolve the connection issue. So um, those are some little tips. And or in summary, here's a full um, solution set up for using agris, agricultural drones for corn spraying. Um, those are all of the webinar today. And now we are open to discussion um, because you are muted, but you could type your questions in the chat window and uh, we'll invite Steve or either myself to answer your questions. So during the presentation, we do see quite a lot of questions coming in. Uh, Steve, how about we go through those and uh, give answers? So the latest one is, uh, I think it's a question for Steve. In regards to the spray swap at a few edges, when the drone is changing direction, you mentioned striking issues being observed. Would this be somewhat fixed by doing a field boundary uh, parameter pass. I may have missed it if you adjust that. Yeah, um, I mean, you can if you run a parameter pass. Uh, sometimes we do um, parameter or trimming the edge. That's what I call it. We, we do that too. Uh, if you have the time to do it, great. You know, uh, why not? Um, I think it's a good way to ensure the boundaries are spray correctly, but also at the same time, usually in the field where I train the boundaries using parameter pass, it's a field with irregular shape. Most of the time it has a lot of tree lines around the edges. I can't get too close. So that's, that's how I do it. In Midwest and maybe mid South as well, if you do have big open fields, regularly in shape, that parameter pass seems to be more of a wasting time because if you set up your parameter correctly, I have enough confidence that I can, you know, spray the field edges pretty well just by going with regular AB lines, you know. Um, so it kind of depends on the situation, you know. I guess that, that's what I'm trying to say. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so if your environment is allowed, meaning you don't have much obstacles at the field, you could leverage the field boundary spring function on the drone. Uh, what that would do is it will add a boundary route to the field edge. And at the same time, when it spray in the middle, the drone will raise the height to avoid, and then also stop spraying when it reach the field to avoid the striking. And at the end of the mission, it will add a boundary spring to make up the spring at the edge as well. And let's take a look into the other questions. I think somebody so asked, yeah, mm. the, the next one, yeah. Um, um, so here's a question from uh, Mitchell. Uh, which DRA was used with the T20P and what was the wind for the WSP slide you show? Um, so which DRA we use with T20P, you said? Yeah. So. Um, we used a few DRAs, you know. Um, I mentioned the name briefly in the talk. Um, so I at this stage, I don't want to specifically pinpoint to one DRA, you know, whether I make it good or make it look bad, you know, that that's not the purpose. So it's still preliminary stage we're evaluating DRAs as a whole. Um, so uh, in terms of which one I use, I have to look into my book. I don't remember on top of my head, you know. We got four or five that we use typically. And next year, this list may grow even longer. Mm -hmm. And then the question above is, oh, there's a request I would like the slides. Um, yes, we, we will share the uh, video record after the webinar on um, DJI Agricultural YouTube channel. Um, 
And the question above that is how much difference you register using hydraulic nozzles, uh, such as XR11005 uh, via spinning disc and the dual models T30 via T40. Um, Steve, I will let you answer first if you have any research results supporting that, and then I will add my opinion as well. Sorry, well, can you repeat that question again? I haven't seen that one in the chat. What was it? Okay. Um, so is the question asked at 11, oh, maybe different time on your on your side, um, but it's from, um, so if you scroll up, um, the question is how much difference you register okay. using hydraulic nozzles VS spinning disc and the model and the dual models T30 VS T40? Um... I mean, it could be a lot of difference. You know, this is not a really fair comparison. You know, it could be apple to orange. And also, I mean, hydraulic nozzles is a very big group. There's a lot of different types, different kinds. Your droplet size can start from 100 micron all the way up to above 650, mm -hmm. you know. And also XR-11005, you know, you don't use that on drone. You know, 11005, that's a ground sprayer. You know, we use on John Deere's, you know, most people use 04. Some of our bigger sprayer can go faster, use 05. So um, spinning disc is a little bit different. Um, in terms of spray quality, you know, um, if you analyze the card for droplet size, I, I don't, I'm not saying it's better than hydraulic. You can do really nice job with hydraulic nozzles in general. The uh, biggest reason I like the spinning disc is because it allows me to spray thicker techniques, you know, that usually I choke out the uh, flathead nozzles. The RA has that problem. We run uh, lots of small plot trials, spray with backpack sprayer anyway, uh, every year. So lots of DRA when you put into the tank, even though you just spray water with that DRA, the pattern of that fly fan collapse, you know, because the DRA is too thick. Um, we haven't seen that with rotary atomizer or spinning disc so far. The other issue we observed with a uh, fly fan nozzle on the drone is where are sandy soil? So whenever we take off, it, we create a dust storm all the time during takeoff and landing. Uh, so many times, I can't tell you how many times, that we spray with a uh, T30 or nozzle drone, you know, and then we don't realize some of the fly fan nozzles are clogged until we already finished the job, start flush, flushing the lines, you know, flushing the uh, chemical out. And then I noticed, oh boy, you know, two or three nozzles are spinning only from one side. You know, they got clogged up. Um, it's almost impossible to capture those clogged nozzles before uh, you spray because there's so many around them. You know, that was another problem we always uh, experienced with the fly fin. Um, some of our guys like fly fan because they really need a bigger droplet. This is where the weak, weakness comes in for the spinning disc. I haven't seen any spinning disc that can produce very consistent large droplets, let's just say 650 and up, not even 500. Still big and small at the same time. So if you're running, let's just say oxygen herbicide on forestry or spray pasture herbicide, you know, triclopyr, fluoroxapyr, aminoperolid, amino that, that group of compound you don't want to drift and you have to use a bigger droplets because your release height is pretty high you know 30 40 feet up in the air i think hydraulic nozzle is still your best bet i wouldn't recommend a rotary atomizer at this point so this this presentation is solely on corners on row crops so i think speeding this works fine but if you ask my opinion outside the row crop area i'll tell you something different mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Steve. You basically cover everything that I want to share. <laughs> so next question. Um, so it's from Jenny. How many liters of each acre do you use for blueberry spraying? <laughs> so that's outside of corn fungicide spraying. And Steve, if you have anything that you can share, please do. Um, I wouldn't go below 10 gallon per acre. You know, 10 gallon per acre is what uh, is about a, a close 100 liter per, per hectare, something like that, um, or 85 or 90, you know. Um, so 10 gallon per acre, we saw fairly good penetration, you know, and, and distribution across the canopy. When we 
go lower than that, particularly like five gallon per acre, is is difficult to get his to get his on the water sensor paper in middle and and deeper into the canopy, you know. And most of the U.S. pesticide label for specialty crops, or particularly fruit trees, require ten gallon per acre anyway. So. Mm -hmm. And um, another question um, is John is John Deere's RTK network in USA compatible with T40? Uh, I've tried to answer that one. Um, I think the answer is no. John Deere's RTK network is not really open to a third party devices. Um, so in that case, I don't think you could use it with a T40. Okay, another question is about droplet size. Um, what about the best droplet size for application? Most literature states 150 to 200 microns is best for various pesticide applications. Do you use bigger droplets just to mitigate shift? Mm, I mean, best droplet size for application really depends on what are you spraying and what type of chemical, you know? Uh, again, if we're talking about row crop application, two, three GPA, really low volume, we have to stay around 200 to 300 micron size. It's going to be small droplets, maybe medium at the best, if you look at ASAB international um, standard, you know? Um, but again, there's so many <laughs> applications out there with spray drone, you can spray anything, including spray the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, sunblock, you know, the white paint on top of the greenhouse. So when you spray, uh, like I mentioned, when you spray forestry application, um, pasture herbicide, you probably have to go with minimum 500 and the bigger, because those oxygen herbicide, you know, like 240, they don't really care when you spray you know, if you spray with bigger or small droplets, they're systemic, which means you hit one part of the plant, herbicide can get into the plant and translocate and kill the whole plant anyway, eventually. It's not a contact. But if you spray a contact chemical, you know, contact herbicide or contact insecticide, uh, or even mosquito spray, and a lot of those insecticides are contact anyway. This is why they have to fly pretty high 100 feet and uh, spray a mist, you know, out. And then the coverage become an issue. You really need to ensure the coverage is good. You have minimal winds causing disturbance. You know, you increase your uniformity, all of those. So it just all depends on your, your purpose of the application. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Um, is DJ Relay available in your market? <laughs> uh, well, so first of all, oh, there's another question about whether Relay is compatible with T16. So Relay right now, it's only compatible with T40 um, and you, in your market because T40 is not available um, and it is not compatible with T30 and any older version. I think there was a question asking about using T10 to spray parameters. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What about T10 for spraying recommendation for parameters for that one? Hmm, OK, yeah. What about the T10 for spraying? Uh, what's recommended parameter? Yeah. Yeah. Steve, you have anything to share? Um, I don't use T10 a lot. Um, it's mainly just for demo on the table, you know, for me. Uh, I sprayed the water a few times. Um, hmm. In terms of spraying like corn fungicide or or uh, row crop material, I don't think the mechanism will be very different than the bigger bigger drones. Uh, it just mm -hmm. you have to reduce your swaths significantly. You know, wind probably has better data, but I probably would say 15 feet wide at the most. Uh, fly height should be similar. Fly speed is just whatever that drone allows you to the top speed. Probably, yep. if I have to take a guess. Yes, agree with Steve. So for uh, for height, then you could set it to around the same parameter as T30 and T40, which is 
about 3.5 to 4.5 meter height. Um, the major differences will be the swarf. You need to narrow the swarf of T10 to about four, five meter um, to five meter. Um, and speed, um, when the swarf and height and application rate is set, then you could maximize the speed as long as your environment is allowed. Mm -hmm. um, there is also a question about which generator recommended for fast charging for T40. Maybe you want us. Yep, this. OK. Sure, so for T40, uh, any generator that could provide um, 12,000 uh, watt would, uh, would, would be recommended. So if you do have accessible to um, DJI's generator in your region, um, that would definitely be recommended. If not, then any third party generator that would provide 12,000 um, watts, um, you could use that one. Uh, if, if your generator is big enough, it has a 240 volt 50 amp plug. Typically, that's big enough for uh, fast charging. Uh, this morning, somebody said a, they bought a new generator which has two plugs of 240 volt and 15 amp. They plug both cable of the charger to the to those two plugs, and they were able to get fast charging. Uh, I mm -hmm. said I, I don't know about it. Maybe that's a possible. I haven't I haven't tested it that way. Oh yeah, that is true. So in order to get fast charging for uh, T40, uh, we do rec we do require uh, two cable charging at the same time. And for each, mm -hmm. uh, the voltage required is 220 to 240 voltage. So uh, if your generator have two 240 voltage outlets. Um, you could use that for fast charging for T40. Somebody asked, are you going to talk about spreading with a drone in a separate webinar? Um, if you remember the end user conference I talked about in next February, yeah, I had a table, it's not the 23, 24, the next February. Yeah, we will talk about spreading with a drone, particularly focus on uh, cover crop seeds. I, I have a little bit of fertilizer data I can I can show you as well, you know, granular uh, herbicide fertilizer data. It, it, it will be uh, available in future events, hopefully um, in next year, next year February's event. Maybe we could host another joint webinar on that topic when you have enough research results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another question from Tom. We have a T40 with the relay, which we love. Rolling field parameter setting would be appreciated. Setting mode mountain or what? Uh, yes, for the task, for the terrain task mode, do set mountain. And at the same time, turn on the obstacle by passing. Um, that would allow the best performance in terms of terrain following, especially in rolling landscape. Mm -hmm. Another question is from Pete. When calculating, do you use the acreage of the whole field before entering the route planning? Or do you use the task area of the route in route setup? Oftentimes, I find the task area is smaller than the initial field size before route setup. I okay. I honestly am not quite sure, but what I guess is after you set up the browse and enter into it, um, the new size that's given on the app is different from the initial size when you plan the field, right? If that's the case, I'm not aware of this issue and I would uh, myself also look it up. Um, but Pete, do you mind leave your email? Uh, maybe privately to myself, and then I can look it up and get back to you on that. I also see two questions regarding the droplet size. One people said they found literature saying 75 to 150 micron is the best. 
The other one says most literature states 150 to 200 is the best for various passes application. So what's your thoughts on that? You know, why using bigger droplets? Well, that, that's a good question. I, I, I think it may come from one people or two people. I, I don't really know, but I mean, if you, you can find all kind of literature. There's got to be a lot out there. And uh, unless they test the whole spectrum, you know, you can't make a robust conclusion anyway. Uh, we all work on research project. We know that. Um, sometimes smaller works better. Sometimes bigger one works better. Uh, in this case, if you if we live in a uh, theoretical world, everything is all picture perfect. You know, everything just like what we assumed. I would say smaller droplets probably would be a better way to go. But in reality, you always have wind. You always have days that is dry, hot, low humidity and windy. That's even worse because your small droplets, 50 micron, 100 micron, probably don't even hit the uh, the leaf and then they are gone, you know, because the uh, evaporation. Uh, that's that's why you have to also consider the low humidity as well. Um, if everything hits the plant, sure, you know, small droplets probably can fall through the canopy easier than bigger droplets. But when you have to combine with the wind problem, you ha you're going to have to balance with the coverage, you know, choose a balance point between the coverage and the drift. This is why we eventually choose uh, anywhere between 250 to 300 micron. Uh, use that as a uh, starting point. Uh, you may can go a little bit lower, but I really doubt you can make it work in reality if you go below 200. You know, that's going to be too small. Uh, like maybe 220 is going to be somewhat risky as well you can try though but um again it, it just whatever results you get what type of efficacy you can get those are highly dependent upon the environmental conditions so you, you may see sometimes it works sometimes it does that's all i'm trying to say but the drift is definitely going to be worse when you use 200 micron we already have field example that i can show you you know for that regard And um, let's take two more questions uh, for today. Another one I found very interesting, and there are a lot users very curious about, is one of the most common concerns for customers is about dosage using drones. Could you talk about your experience? Does any study cover this subject? Um, so dosage, I assume you're, you're talking about product use rate, you know, or the active ingredient rate, uh, if, if that's what you mean by dosage. Uh, I generally tell people that whatever rate you use for your ground sprayer, for your uh, crop dust, for the airplane, uh, you know, to mm -hmm. spray, that rate or dosage is going to be the same for drone. Uh, I do not recommend you go below um, the recommended rate. And a lot of time to enhance the efficacy, we actually go with the highest label rate, um, you know, when we spray with the drone. And the reason is simple. If you are a commercial operator, you want to apply pesticide for your customer to make a living, you know, to make a living, you have to make sure your efficacy looks good. And you don't want to challenge yourself too much by cutting back a rate 25 percent and still hoping for the same efficacy if that works that's great if it doesn't work you're not going to get a customer back again you know that's the risk for um, for cutting back a rate for the commercial operation for a private applicator well in the u.s we call it private applicators basically that means farmers flying drones spraying his own crop his own field we call it private application for private application it is a selling point because if the farmer can use 70 percent of the chemical and gets 100 percent efficacy that means saving money uh, although a lot of time it's good too good to be true because you still lose decent amount to um, a drift to aerial wind drift and also whether you can place the chemical uniformly across the field. That's another thing. You always have hot spot and cold spot. Hot spot is fine. You can kill the pest. Cold spot is where you have the problem. The concentration is low. You miss that spot. 
So the best way to ensure the consistency is still by putting out the sufficient amount of AI or active ingredient to begin with. So those cold spot where you don't cover very well doesn't have too low of chemical concentration below the threshold so it doesn't kill the pest. Because the worst thing is your cold spot harbor insects, disease, or that's your huge weedy patches you don't kill. You know, so the lower you go with the dose, the more risk you have to assume. You know, so I would say, because I work for public, if you hear some dealer saying that, oh, you can cut your chemical rate back to 20% or 30% or 50%, still use a drone to spray and get same efficacy, that's just a common sales pitch. In reality, I don't think that will happen, you know. And also, the, another risk is when you cut back your dose too much, resistance management will become a big issue. You're training your pest to handle those lower than threshold concentration and enhance their mechanism to evolve more resistance. Five years later, you may not be able to kill that pest, whether this is insect disease or whatever, mostly weeds uh, anymore using that chemistry. So that's an even bigger problem, in my opinion. Okay, let's take one more question and we call it today. Um, so this is a, there's a field planning question um, from Tom. Do you pre-map fields with what is elevation data used in spring fly planning? So uh, regarding whether map the fields are pre-mapped, um, using the drone for spring, there are normally two modes. One is manual, one is auto. In manual spring, which is used very rarely, I would say, especially in North America, uh, you don't pre-map the field and just manually fly to spray where you want. It's more common seen in spot spring, I would say, or some very small fields, such as the fields in Japan, than they would do uh, manual spring. In those cases, you don't pre-map the field. But in most of the other uh, scenario, which are automatic uh, operation, then pre-mapping the field is always required. Um, regarding with what, um, there are several methods. Um, either you could walk around the field with your remote controller or fly your drone around the field boundary to tap on the corners to mark the field corners, or you could use a mapping drone or the FPV on the spring drone to generate a automatic imagery of the field and then draw the field boundary. Um, that is the way. Um, whether elevation data is involved, it also depends on either you're using a what we call a uh, land mode or a fridge mode. In land mode, uh, we don't use any external elevation data. Uh, we use the radar system and the vision system on board to sense the height above the ground and then maintain cons consistent height above the ground. Um, but if you are doing a uh, fruit tree spraying and use the fruit tree mode, then we do use that elevation data from the mapping mission, uh, which is a pre map elevation data, and then generate 3D fly paths. So um, that is the logic behind it. Hopefully, it answers your question. Um, and at last, uh, what I'm going, because we, I think we don't get all the questions and you might have more coming. Uh, I would leave my email here as well. And Steve left the email earlier in his slides. So if you want to reach any of us, please feel free to. Um, and I want to thank you everyone for joining the webinar and especially Steve, thank you very much for being the speaker at this webinar. Uh, we really appreciate the information and the insights that you share. Um, those are very, very helpful for the community. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Enjoyed it.